Happy Friday, everybody. As part of our commitment to keep you informed about the issues related to Fannie and Freddie, we're going to continue to do uh, meetings like this, whether it's over Zoom, where you can see me in person and, and, and get my ideas about what is going on, or the written communication like we did last Friday. So what I want to do initially is start out by telling you what the impact of these court cases were on your investment um, in, in the past couple of weeks. First of all, the investment thesis of Fannie and Freddie is still intact. These are preferred issues that we hold that are embedded in the capital structure of the companies, and they have to be paid. They have to be dealt with somehow by the court system and have to be dealt with in the recapitalization and release of Fannie and Freddie. So the, the important thing is they're not going to zero. The issue, and it is significant, and it had a big impact in the decline of the shares is the uncertainty about how long this is going to take to be resolved. Because the time value of money and the length of time that it has taken for these cases to wind their way through the courts and the whole issue of how long it has taken to get to the reform of Fannie and Freddie and release them from conservatorship and whether or not there's any intent to do that, that's what is important at this point to investors. But the big thing is it's not going to zero. These investments have intrinsic value and they have that value primarily because these are two of the most profitable companies in the world. They're not companies in distress. They make billions of dollars every quarter. They have embedded in their structure $30 billion of the pre-tax profit. So that's what attracted us to that and my knowledge of how the capital structure of a company works and how these investments will eventually play out once they reform them and they release them from conservatorship. So that's the important part. They're not going away. It's a question of how long will it take to recognize that $25 or $50 par value, face value that they have. So your investment right now at $2, it has a face value of $25. If it's a $3, if it's worth $3 and 50 cents, and typically it has a face value of $50. How long is it gonna take for us to recognize that value. Then that is a function of both the court system and even more importantly, what they do in the recapitalization and release of these entities. They are woefully short of capital and that is impacting the mortgage market. And as you'll see, as we unpack this a little bit further later in my talk, um, there is real incentive right now to get these, this issue resolved after more than 10 years of having to deal with it. So the second thing that I think is important is what is the impact this has had on your account? And we've done a, a really broad survey account by account. You know, we have some of the most sophisticated data measuring techniques for the performance of your account of any firm in the industry. There's nothing actually more sophisticated. We calculate on a time-weighted basis the impact of every security in your account, give you a report every quarter that shows what the return is, and then it measures it against indexes. And so as we look through the impact of this on accounts, the returns have generally been very good. They've been somewhere between six and a half and 17% this year. So it also tells you, you know, that an investment, you can have an investment that significantly underperforms like Fannie and Freddie Mac have during the first six months of this year, and you're still making money. You know, you might not make as much money in the short term, but in the long term, there'll be no impact. I have a, a client that has been with me for 38 years, and we have measured the performance of his account 
since April of 2000, and even after the decline of Fannie Mae, and he had a large position. His long-term return is 7.05% versus 5% for the S&P 500 and 6% for NASDAQ. That return is also calculated net of all fees and, and transaction charges. And so when you look at it in that perspective in a long, as a longer term investor, there were a lot of things that happened during that period. And one of the things that I'm concerned about, and one of the reasons why I even fool with an investment like this is that you have to have non-correlating assets. You can't have your money tied up in something like the S&P 500. We believe that when you have hot markets like we've had. The last time we've seen a market like this was 2000. And in 2000, everybody had money in technology stocks. Everybody was making money. Everybody thought that it was easy. And less than a year later, we started on a downward trend. And you know, on NASDAQ had a negative compound average annual rate of return for 16 years. The S&P 500, was negative for about 10 years, and it was anemic for the next five years. And as you can see, even the comparison since 2000, NASDAQ has only averaged 6% a year. People have lost that perspective. You know, the S&P 500 has only averaged a 5% return since 2000, people have lost that perspective. And that will come back when this euphoria is over, and we hope to have investments that are completely non-correlated, and we hope to have protected your money when this market euphoria is over. It's a very difficult task right now because in 2000, I had 5.5% AAA rated tax-free bonds. I had 8 to 9% high-grade corporate bonds. And so we could insulate an account and have a good return embedded in that while the market went, went past us and then eventually declined. We don't have that now. We've got the resurgence of inflation. We've got a 1.5% 10-year treasury. Incredibly, a 30-year government bond is only paying 2%. So we know that if you invest in a 10-year treasury at 1.5% for 10 years and inflation is 3%, then you're going to lose one and a half percent per year in that fixed income investment. And indeed, had you kept your money in treasuries for the last six months, you would have lost money. There would be no positive return. Your account would be down significantly year to date. So this is also, you know, part of an overall strategy that we have to make these investments uh, to make your investment portfolio work over time. And it's, it's a little difficult to see that now. So the impact on your account is going to be dependent upon how much Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac you own. And, and you know, that is the key. And we have the data, we'll be able to share that with you as we have with clients going forward. So let's get into what actually happened um, with the Collins case and why you had this very negative reaction in the price of Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac um, since the decision was set down. First of all, I think it's real important to understand where these cases are in the legal proceedings, in the process of litigation. These cases were initially dismissed uniformly across the board um, on the basis of a misrepresentation that the Treasury made to Judge Lamberth in the DC circuit in which they said Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac were in a death spiral or they're, they're hopelessly lost. We know that's not true because the chief financial officer of Fannie Mae later testified after there was discovery in the US Court of Claims, she testified that she had just briefed the treasury and that these entities were very profitable. Um, and, and that puts the government squarely in the position of misrepresenting the position, financial position of these companies to a United States federal judge. That's not a desirable position to be in as a litigant when you make 
a, the magnitude when you make a misrepresentation of that like you did. And we'll, we'll come back to the Lambert case and see what kind of impact that that has had after we deal with Collins. So Collins, the Collins case, it was decided in the Fifth Circuit. It was initially dismissed. The Court of Appeals said, no, there are claims here. There are claims that the government exceeded their authority under the statute that was governing Fannie and Freddie while they were in conservatorship. And there are also claims under the Constitution because the director of the FHFA is unconstitutional. Um, the appointment was unconstitutional. And so that worked its way through the appeals court. The appeals court reversed the trial court's ruling. And then there was a kind of an extraordinary step. There was an en banc hearing. And this is when all of the justices within the Fifth Circuit agreed to review this case and so instead of three judges, it was 16 judges. And the 16 judges on a very narrow ruling ruled that the government exceeded their authority under HERA, under the Administrative Procedures Act. And there was a remedy for shareholders. And then they also uh, agreed that the director of the Federal Housing Finance Administrator, Administration it was an unconstitutional appointment. It was unconstitutional because the president didn't have removal authority. So you had an independent agency that was set up that should have been directly supervised by the president. And that was unconstitutional. And so the president had removal authority. So the exercise of that removal authority was deferred pending the outcome of this case before the United States Supreme Court for 12 years. So it took 12 years since the FHFA was set up for them finally to be a ruling. And President Biden, in less than 24 hours after the court ruled, he fired the current director, the former director of the FHFA, Mark Calabria. So he was out. So he was able to exercise his removal authority. So the FHFA is no different than any other cabinet position now. You get a new president, you get a new director, just like you get a new director of defense, you get a new secretary of state, you get a new director of the Department of Energy. And as we'll see as we go forward, that has a big impact on the future of these companies and I believe the speed with which they will be um, dealt with from an administrative standpoint in the recapitalization and release theory. So the court clearly said we don't want to involve ourselves in second guess what a director does um, in the administration of Fannie and Freddie. So they deny the Administrative Procedures Act claim and they reverse that. But they took it one step further. The Collins court had also ruled that the director was unconstitutionally appointed, but they gave the plaintiffs no remedy. And the court said, yes, there is a remedy. And the remedy is under the constitution. It's tied directly to whether there was a taking and whether or not there was a, the, you could tie directly what the director did in his unconstitutional appointment to the harm that we have experienced as shareholders. Well, that was significant because they also took it one step further. Prior to this ruling in the court, first of all, it was questionable whether we even had a claim. We do have a claim now. It's under the Constitution. Secondly, these claims had been adjudicated. They've been ruled that they were derivative claims through this process. And the court said, no, these are not derivative claims. What's a derivative claim? Well, if it, a derivative claim would have put the liability for the harm that had occurred, it would have put that liability on the, on the companies themselves. So how is a company that's in conservatorship building up capital, how are they ever gonna get out of the situation that they're in if the liability for the harm that was created to shareholders has to be paid by the company to the shareholders? It made no sense. And so it is a direct claim now of the shareholders under the constitution, under the unconstitutional appointment of the director and the 
U.S. Court of Claims that we'll talk about in a minute. So today at one o'clock Eastern time, the attorneys in the Collins case, this has been remanded back to the trial court now for further findings consistent with their opinion. They have to file a five page brief that I'll be studying and I'll put more information out on it um, early next week. And perhaps we'll even have another one of these calls. Um, that Collins case then will have some direction and there will be an interpretation by both sides about what this court mean, ruling means as it relates to recovery by the shareholders in that particular case. Um, and, and that'll be <clears throat> very important to see how David Thompson um, and the attorneys at Arnold, uh, they, David Thompson for the plaintiff and Arnold Porter for the defense, for the defense on the defense behalf of the government, how they interpret this court ruling and how they're going to go forward. And again, very important to understand that despite this time that's gone on and all the things that we know, we know about what Mario Ugletti did. We know about Susan McFarland and her testimony as CFO. And we know that immediately after the government said that these companies were in a death spiral, they paid the largest single dividend nine months later in the history of the world, $60 billion. They paid back the $189 billion that they had borrowed from the government at 10% interest in, in almost you know, in three years or so. Um, we know that there's a surplus over and above what they borrowed after you amortize those payments. We know all of that, but that's never been adjudicated. It's never been at the trial level where the evidence has been presented and the judge or a jury has had an opportunity to evaluate it and evaluate the impact of that on our damages. It's extraordinary, but unfortunately that's how litigation goes and, and it takes, it just takes time. So um, that's about what I want to say for the, for, the Lamb, for the Collins case. Going into the Collins case, you know, I didn't feel like it was as important. I definitely felt like the court would not rule the way they did where they completely reversed it and they created this narrow path. Um, where our claims as shareholders would be constitutional, but they did. And, and I think there's some wisdom in that. I'll never second guess the court system because they're uh, extraordinarily brilliant people. They come together as a deliberative body. That's our constitution and that's how they decided. And, and I think there is a, a clear path forward still to victory. And that path to victory, again, it's narrow because we are preferred shareholders. We're not common shareholders. We have an order of preference in these companies to get paid based upon the earnings and profits that they generate, or even in the event that they decide to liquidate them. We have $33 billion worth of preferred stock. They make that much in a single year. These entities have over $5 trillion worth of mortgages on their books. They're inherently profitable. So we've got that path. So why is the Lambert case so important? Well, that case had been dismissed as well at the trial court after the government lied to Judge Lambert and he used that lie and this death spiral narrative that was is false and will finally be adjudicated, have an opportunity to go before a jury. That was false. And it went back to the Court of Appeals and the Court of Appeals sent it back to Judge Lambert to consider what our rights were as shareholders. But that court had already rejected the Administrative Procedures Act claim that the United States Supreme Court just ruled and rejected. So they sent it back and Judge Lamberth in his wisdom um, as uh, you know, a, one of the most respected judges in the federal court system, he said the government is going to have to answer a single count of whether they complied with the covenant of good faith and fair dealing that's embedded in every contract. And the theory behind that is you can have a 100,000 page document. And if the parties to the document are not exercising good faith in that contract, in, in what they put their signature to, that you can look beyond the complexities of the document and you can boil it down to the common denominator. 
the IRS has a similar type catch-all provision in the code, in the Internal Revenue Service code. There has to be a business purpose to a, a loss or a deduction. And if there is none, then they can just say there's no business purpose and wipe it out. So that's that was very powerful. And it was very um, telling that the judge narrowed the focus of everything that had happened since he dismissed this case in the trial court and it went to the court of appeal and it went to the court of appeals and then back to him. So the government is standing trial for whether or not they complied with the covenant of good faith and fair dealing. That case is also now reinforced by the fact that these are direct claims against the government and that there is a constitutional taking. And that constitutional taking is also directly related to the contract claims that shareholders have. So that's a very significant case. It is well along its way in terms of the discovery. There are, um, there's a, uh, the end of discovery will be sometime in, in November. There will be a, a period where they can, both parties will submit briefs on summary judgment. The plaintiffs will say, we've proven everything we need to prove judge. And there's nothing for a trier of fact. The defendants will say, no, they haven't proved anything in this case needs to be dismissed. That'll be the next threshold time period. And then after that, it will go to trial um, sometime in between May and July. There's a little movement right now in the scheduling order uh, of when that trial will actually occur. What's also fascinating about this um, is that in the U.S. Court of Claims, which we'll talk about in a minute, which really allowed for the discovery that enabled us to in part overturn Judge Lambert's decision. This is when we learned that the government lied because we had no chance at even looking at evidence. The government, after the Court of Claims ruled against them and said there is discovery, and this case is going to you know, go forward on what they call jurisdictional discovery. The government made, government made a big mistake, one of the biggest mistakes ever in, in litigation pleading. They pled facts that weren't in evidence and that opened the door to the judge to say, well, there's discovery. And, and, and so after they lost that ruling and they had to answer and produce documents, the government convinced Judge Sweeney that as a matter of national security, this case um, had to be kept under seal. All the documents have to be kept under seal. So one of the unique things about this, except in very limited, uh, in a very limited way, thousands and thousands of pages of discovery have only been viewed by the attorneys. The attorneys can't even share it with the people they represent. And at some point, all of that's going to be um, that's going to be released. There have been thousands of pages of documents that the Obama administration asserted executive privilege on and the deliberative process. And, and so that is going to be have a big impact also when the light of day is shed on the evidence. Again, and the triers of fact can look at it and they can make a decision about whether the government acted in good faith, whether they acted consistent with the requirement embedded in, in the contract of good faith and fair dealing, or they were just determined to not pay shareholders in violation of the corporate structure and the contract rights that they held. So the next case, so the, the Lambert case is alive and well, it was strengthened by the ruling that the court made in Collins' case. And he said, it's kind of hard to believe that given how the shares declined in value, but that's, you know, the, there's a lot of other dynamics there. It, it's the amount of time, it's the expectation, it's the kind of shareholders that they have, you know, and, and what that, how that impacts the market. Um, and so the fact that these have stabilized and they've started to move up a little bit since the darker days, two days after the ruling, you know, tells you that they still have value. 
and I'm in contact with the large shareholder groups and, and the long-term investors, the ones that understand the fundamentals of these companies, they've held their position or they've added to their position. Whether we add to your position or not will be part of a discussion that we will have with you about that to kind of take your temperature about how you feel about it. The other part about this is that we will be doing some tax loss selling. Um, and so we'll swap. So for example, we could sell series S and buy series T, generate a tax loss if you have one. And we haven't changed our position because they're essentially the same security with the same $25 face value but the IRS would allow us to recognize a tax loss that we can use against your other gains. So there'll be a lot of work that we'll be doing between now and the end of the year, a lot of study on that. So let's now go to the U.S. Court of Claims. What's the U.S. Court of Claims? The U.S. Court of Claims is where cases go that where there's an issue of a taking under the Fifth Amendment United States Constitution. You can't the government can't take property without just compensation to that. And that case was, the oversight for that case was Judge Margaret Sweeney. Judge Sweeney has retired. There is a new judge taking the case, Judge Schwartz. He's 38 years old, so he's got a long runway in front of him um, that will, you know, he'll be there at the end for this case. So Judge Sweeney unpredictably so given the nature of everything that had been in front of her she said that these were not direct claims against the government they're derivative claims still a, an unconstitutional kept alive the idea that it would be the takings that the trier of fact that she would rule that these ultimately were a taking but that case was up on appeal and it was on appeal for that very issue of whether it was a derivative or a direct claim. Well, now that the Supreme Court has ruled that these are direct claims, um, there it's been sent back. It will be sent back to the Court of Claims um, and it will proceed on that basis. So that case has, again, a lot more teeth than it did because there's nothing worse in litigation to be able to prove that you were right, have a judgment, and then have a defendant that can't pay the judgment. So that part of the equation has been re removed um, from consideration at this point. So let me kind of recap um, what I've talked about so far. Number one, these aren't going to zero. They have value. They will continue to go through the court system. The court system will ultimately make a decision about whether there's been a taking either under our contract rights or as an unconstitutional taking under the law, uh, under, under the Fifth Amendment. These claims are direct. The government's responsible. And that part of it will go forward. Um, and it will go forward in a way that in the next 12 months, as the focus is on the Lambert case and the Lambert trial, it will have some impact and we will have some resolution. We will start to see the shape of that resolution even as early as today when the, when the attorneys file their five page response in, in front of Judge Atlas in the Collins case and as the Lambert case and as the U.S. Court of Claims case goes forward. So that's the litigation side. Let's talk about solutions. And, and I wanna focus on where we are now compared to where we were right after the conservatorship. As you know, my good friend, Senator Bob Corker, um, had the belief that these entities should be wound down and, and a new system for ensuring liquidity in the mortgage market and the 30 year mortgage would take place. That has been rejected uniformly. There is no talk about winding down and liquidating these entities, which quite frankly, I think would have been better for us as preferred shareholders because they would have had to pay that $33 billion obligation 
in winding down two profitable companies. So what does that do to where we are right now? Well, there's numerous proposals about what to do with these entities. And uniformly, all the people that have stakes in this, whether it's the Mortgage Bankers Association, whether it's the Small Lenders Association, the mortgage underwriters, they all agree that these entities need capital because they've all been impacted. Their constituencies have been impacted by the fact that there hasn't been any capital. And Mark Calabria, the former FHFA director, um, did a tremendous amount of work in reshaping these entities so that they, um, um, so that they have they reflect the fact that they don't have capital and the risk that there is to taxpayers in entities that have no capital. We require banks to adhere to strict capital requirements because we don't want the taxpayers to be liable for the mistakes that they may make or the economic conditions that make loan losses prevalent. We don't want to guarantee that. Well, we don't want that in Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac either. And there's almost $6 trillion worth of mortgages that are not on the books of the United States Treasury right now. And we don't need another $6 trillion worth of liability on the United States Treasury right now. Um, and, and so they've got to have capital. They've got to have that private capital buffer. And that's why in 1968, President Johnson, before started with President Johnson, why they came to this agreement to keep this liability off the books and have a private public partnership to ensure the financing of Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. And so uh, what I like to do when I look at any kind of issue, I break it down to the lowest common denominator of why an issue will succeed or why it will fail in, in terms of any type of investment thesis. We know now we have a direct claim under the constitution we know that we have contract rights that are being litigated. And we know that there is no alternative to meet the needs of housing finance for homeowners, for small middle-class homeowners. The average mortgage, the largest mortgage Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac can make is $512,000. So we know that they serve a constituency that's important, goes all the way back to the depression, you know, with FDR and Henry Morgenthau, when they solved the problem that was embedded in our banking system that allowed for longer term mortgages um, and, and basically helped save the banking, you know, industry. So we know all of that. So what's the one variable that nobody's really considering? And, and, and I think this is very significant. When you look at how they structured the Federal Housing Finance Administration under the Housing and Economic Recovery Act of 2008. When you look at that, these are supposed to be independent agencies accountable to no one, removable by the president for cause. The agents, the, the director could be only removed for cause. And in addition to for or, or for dereliction of duty. Well, that was a pretty high bar. It's different than any other federal agency and it was struck down. So what is the status of the Federal Housing Finance Administration? It's now a political appointment and it will change with every administration. And every administration is going to have a different view of how they see the world and how they want the world shaped. For example, President Biden, whether you agree with it or not, he appointed a new Department of Energy. What did he do by executive order? I think within 24 hours of being sworn into office, he canceled the Keystone Pipeline. He threw thousands and thousands of people out of work because he has a different approach to energy and he has a different approach to the pace at which we are going to address climate change. And that's embedded in his beliefs. The American people voted for him and he's now president. So. President Biden is also going to have, through his administration, he's going to have a very significant belief system about affordable housing, 
about the availability of financing for low and moderate income people that Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac serve. And if he's going to have some lasting impact on that policy, then he has to act and he has to act within 18 to 24 months. So I don't believe this is going to go on forever because at the end of the day, if he doesn't get these entities set on a path out of conservatorship, then his successor um, could very well on the very first day of office unwind everything that he did to address and meet the needs of his constituency in the way that he wanted to do it. So now you have, you know, you have a driver here. You've got the political process that's very favorable to a solution because everybody else is in line. Everybody's feeling the pain from these entities not being recapitalized and released. And you still have very, very viable court actions. It's a question of how much time. And that's unpredictable, but we feel that it is significant enough to hold these investments and stay with the thesis, as disappointed as we are that we are not moving as fast as we thought. And, you know, the, I've got a, a, a plaque on my wall that was written by a, um, one of the former editors of the Wall Street Journal, Vermont Royster, and he talks about the, the waves, waves lapping on the seashore. And when you study them, it isn't until you study them for a long time that you know, really know what direction the current was moving. And so we don't know how long this is going to take. And there's speculation. There's a lot of speculation. You know, it's easy to get very negative and say it's not going to happen. It's going to take a long period of time. The courts are going to rule against you. That's unpredictable. The basics are in place. These are embedded agencies within our financial system. They're important to the future of home ownership. They're important to the American dream. The government took the money and they are going to have to answer whether or not they provided just compensation for it to preferred shareholders. So that's the way I see it. Um, I am disappointed. I'm not, you know, I, I'm not um, giving up. I don't quit on these kinds of things. Um, I am in contact um, daily with the, the, the players, the people that really will have an impact on this issue. Um, as soon as his schedule will allow it, um, I'm going to have John Roscoe, who was the chief operating officer, chief of staff for Mark Calabri in the Federal Housing Finance Administration. He left um, the agency um, a week ago today. Uh, I'm going to have him down here for a luncheon in which all Fannie Mae shareholders will be invited to, any of our clients that would like to attend, will be invited to to, to be here and, and hear him speak and talk specifically about that. I've spoken to him twice in the last week. And, and so I do have access to a lot of information that doesn't show up in the Wall Street Journal. You know, and, and I will say this, you know, one of the things that's impacted this issue is the quality of journalism today. You know, everybody's focused on budgets, everybody's trying to make ends meet. And good journalism takes, first of all, it, it takes good journalists. And then those good journalists have to have the time to research and investigate a story like this. Um, and when you don't have, when, when the system, and we'd all agree to that, that the system is deficient right now, that, that no one really trusts the, the journalistic process, the news, you have to go deeper. You have to independently pull together many different sources of information to formulate an opinion. Um, that that hasn't helped either. So I hope this has been helpful. Um, you know, I, I've told any of you, reach out to me directly. I'm, I'm available at my 
and that's day and night, it's weekends, you know, I always respond um, and, and I'm always willing to engage you about these topics um, and, and how they affect your investments and how we are you know, committed to making you successful. That's our job. You know, we, we want, we want success, you know, and we've got a long-term pattern of success with people. That's how we got here. That's how you placed your trust in us in the first place. So thank you. Um, I look forward to hearing from you. We'll be getting your quarterly reports with the very detailed information about your returns out. Um, sometime, um, the week of the 15th of July and um, enjoy the fourth.